Kyle here from All Media Reviews. Uh, Friday, uh, a couple big albums came out today. D Darren King's DK, the drummer, Lockers Volume 1. Thumbs up, I'll probably be talking more about that hopefully next week. Um, uh, Dream of Electric Sleeps, Apocalypse uh, Garden. Haven't listened to it that much yet, but liking it. And also Gavin Castleton put out a record um, called uh, Pattern Breaker. That was last week, but the anyway... There was a, a single also from Childish Japes that came out. So, um, but just the, I'm here to do the 1989 albums of the year video. But I did find, of course, in my my hunting and looking for my collection, Brian Wilson's self-titled album, which you know I bought. I don't know how many years ago. What year was it? 2011. But I don't know it. Um, and then my my full copy of Halloween's um, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part Two. So that's at least good. <laughs> From the last from the 88 uh, list so anyway let's go over this as p fast as possible I don't I didn't get a chance to really go through all the rate your music lists and stuff so the, again the rough draft is there aren't too many that are on the list at the bottom after the rankings um, but I'll go through them Kate Bush's sense the sensual 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 world don't know it um, but um, this album you know what I'm gonna Put, put this in here, sort of shoehorn it in here, actually, after listening to it. So, yeah. Um, Princess Batman. I'm going to put, let's see here. I'll put this right about. Yeah, maybe right here. Um, Princess Batman, which has Bat Dance. And I listened to, like, one of the track. Um, Arms of Orion features Sheena Easton. It's not his best work. It's a soundtrack, though. That's the thing. So, um, although technically Parade was a soundtrack, I believe, to Under the Cherry Moon. And I don't know about um, Graffiti Bridge soundtrack. I don't know. But anyway, it's it's not. I mean, I like Bat Dance, but that's basically it. Technotronics. I don't even have the name of their album on here. But they, of course, had the song Pump Up the Jam, which was really a big deal. And the Blue Niles Hats, which was... Really highly rated. I don't know the Blue Nile, although I'm pretty sure Jake Root has played some of their songs, so I've seen some of their videos. But I mean, I you had to ask me what songs the Blue Nile. I don't know, but they're highly regarded. There's people that like prog that like them, so I think they're kind of a new wave band. But anyway, um, so going from the bottom, Madonna's "Like a Prayer" number 25. It includes the title track, "Express Yourself," and "Cherish," among others. I couldn't find, my wife has a copy. I know she does not like the title track, but that don't, wouldn't mean she wouldn't have the record, and like the songs on the record, but she probably has, I just couldn't find it. So number 24, and I've got two copies here, because it's really for really one song. I mean, you could say the same thing about um, the Technotronic album or whatever, or Bat Dance and some others, but this is a Linda Ronstead. It's with, I don't know if the album actually is... Yeah, featuring Aaron Neville. Um, Cry Like a Rainstorm, Howl Like the Wind. It, they won the Grammy for that. For that song, I think it was. But the song on here, I'll admit, I'll completely, unapologetically admit, the song that's totally... One, it, Linda Ronson, you know, known for doing her own versions of, of songs that were done by other people, or written by other people, at least. Um, but it has Goodbye My Friend, the last track. I'm I brought to tears every time I hear that. Um, Carla Bonoff, I believe, originally wrote and performed that song, but um, but I think it's the title track, "Cry Like a Rainstorm," won the Grammy. So yeah, I mean, I have it on CD. I but I will say unapologetically, I shouldn't be embarrassed like that song. But they used it in an episode of Baywatch when one of the characters died, and I just I'll never forget that. So yeah, hi Kaja. So. Um, that's number 24. Number 23, I had this on cassette when I was in, whatever it was, 89, would have been 8th grade. Yeah. Uh, Billy Joel's Stormfront, which, of course, says, We Didn't Start the Fire and Going to Extremes. But that's, that cassette is probably, you well, know, I have some cassettes from my past, but I don't know what happened to that cassette, unfortunately. But I remember reading through the lyrics many times for that. Um, so that's number 23. Three, number 22, um, where is it, right here, the Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman and Howe album, ABWH, just self-titled, 
Um, which is kind of just an unofficial Yes album, of course. It has the Roger Dean artwork. First time Bill Bruford worked with the Yes guys, really, since the 70s. He worked with Bill Bruford on, I mean, worked with Chris Squire, I believe, on Chris Squire's Fish Out of Water. But I don't know how many other times he played with any of the Yes guys until then, from the point that he left with, um, whatever it be, technically not close to the edge, but, um... Yes songs, but um, I like this probably more than, like, I, I like this more than uh, Big Generator. I've still kind of never been blown away by it. Now, the tour, of course, was a really great tour, and of course, the Union tour, you can say the same thing about. Uh, Brother of Mine is the one, it's a 10-minute, 18-minute song. We played that on the radio once. That's the one track I think of it for, Quartet, I guess, but um, it would be higher if I listened to it more, but... Um, yeah, it's it's okay. It's it's a slight up, uh, improvement from the you know the Yes West music that was being done at that time. So with Trevor Rabin, um, and my cat is is trying to ask for attention, of course. So number twenty two, number twenty one, Peter Gabriel's Passion. It's a soundtrack. I got it from the library years ago. I revisited it again yesterday. It's it's fine, but it's a soundtrack like uh, Bat. Batman from Prince or something like that. It's all instrumental music and it's just atmospheric stuff that goes with. And I don't, I don't really have a desire to watch The Last Temptations of Christ, um, but it's fine. I mean, it's not the worst thing Gabriel maybe has ever done, but at the same time, it's the most nondescript. You know, I don't think it had any singles, so because there weren't any vocals and you know, it's just kind of it fit with the movie, I guess. But I've never seen the movie, so number twenty one, number twenty. Uh, TNT album Intuition, probably the most highly regarded of this band. I believe they were from like Norway, and they did a style of you could call it hair metal or you know glam metal of a sort. Um, but I, I know when I got into Fate's Warning and Queensrÿche, the prog metal stuff, and then some of the power metal. The, these guys were recommended by someone, and mostly maybe for the the soaring vocals of Tori, Tony Harnell. It has a lot of, like, catchy, melodic tracks. I mean, it's not really prog metal. I mean, the, the guitar works okay, but it's mostly just the melodic sense that wins. Um, a Nation Free, Caught Between the Tigers, Nice Dynamics, Tonight I'm Falling, End of the Line, the title track. Um, I like it better than the previous record, which I also tell them to, I also listen to. And I, I saw that on vinyl, I think, at Cheapo one a few years ago, and I didn't buy it. Uh, I probably should have, but I've never seen this on vinyl, I don't think. But I like this record. I mean, it's probably a little low, actually, because I, I probably listened to this, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 times back in the mid to late 90s when I, when I first bought it. But anyway, Intuition from TNT, number 20. Number 19, all right, so I just put this in. So actually, this would be, yes, this would be 19, this would be 20. That teen, Everything's down one, my bad, because I just inserted this. So this, this would be number 20. Get a tie for 20. The Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique. Um, kind of revolutionary from a standpoint of one of the first albums that really was very creative using of samples and clips. I mean, and it's filled with them. It's, they use, Eggman uses Superfly, the Curtis, from the Curtis Mayfield song, and also takes a sample from Psycho. Um, the Sound of Silence references the Beatles carry that weight, the ending kind of, um, Da, 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 you know. Um, Three Minute Rule has a funny line, I'm chilling like Bob Dylan. Hey Ladies um, has the line, I think it's this one, I got more hits than Sadahara O. Uh, there's a Captain Kirk reference in there, I think, or the song before it. And Shod Rock, uh, who ha ha uses the uh, a sample from Who's That Lady by the Spinners. It's very creative, and again, it was kind of a, a unique, I mean, some artists had done that. Obviously, Pink Floyd had used samples, but never using samples from music and maybe more pop culture stuff. And totally, I mean, it, it's it's charming. And I is it better than um, uh, the previous record with Paul Revere, um, Licensed to Ill? I think it's more creative. I don't know if it's better from a song-to-song -song standpoint, but um, anyway. I'm not a huge Beastie Boys fan, but from early rap, yeah, I appreciate it, so... So that's number 20. So number 19, we've got the debut album from, I don't know, they were from Canada because Sebastian Bach was Skid Row, you know, 
uh, this is a self-titled Skid Row album. Um, down in the Valley back in... Is this really? I bought this in 1995. I, I'm surprised it was that long ago. But again, this was 89, so this was even six years before that, or six years, you know, came out. But it's basically, I know it for two songs especially. Uh, 18 in Life and I Remember You. Those were the two singles, the two song videos they got on TV. Ricky was a young boy. I know people that love them, and actually they did some sort of somewhat progressive stuff. Actually, it wasn't on this record, but the one after it, but I've never heard that. I don't know if I get to that in a couple of years, a couple of videos, I'll end up, but... Yeah, I mean, it has, you know, a few others. It was hair metal still like in, like like uh, TNT, but maybe, I mean, Sebastian Bach. I know he's a big Rush fan and everything like that. Um, Youth Gone Wild. Okay, that's the other, I forgot that, forgot that track. That was one of the other hits on here. Um, you know, Piece of Me, uh, Can't Stand the Heartache, Big Guns. Yeah, I mean, it, hair metal was all the rage in the late 80s. It wasn't like the mid 80s, the late 80s. Guns N' Roses and Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and Poison and Rat, you know, Skid Row's right up there, although they started a little bit later. And I would add another band I'll be talking about in the 90s, you know, Saigon Kick kind of, you know, fall, fell apart. Even Dream Theater, to some extent, Extreme. There are a lot of bands that did it that combined progressive stuff with, with uh, hair metal, but, you know, whatever. So that's number 19. Number 18, Nena Cherry. Nena? Nene Cherry. Uh, Raw Like Sushi, and I was just watching like a documentary about her yesterday, but it features the absolute banger. I just absolutely love the song Buffalo Stands. I, it, total nostalgia, and then Jake Root started playing that on his show a couple years ago, and I remembered how much I loved that song. Combining elements of like, you know, almost early um, trip-hop, you know, rap, pop, R&B, funk, you know, and she had just so much swagger, so much like presence and um, with that song and kind of what the fashion sense she used. But, you know, the rest of the record, I listened to it, I like a lot of. Kisses on the Wind specifically was another one that I like. But um, it's really weird, her accents. Like, she's from Sweden, but her parents are mixed between, her, like, her father, I guess, was born in Africa. Maybe it was her mother was born in Africa. Anyway, um, and then she had, like, a step-parent. Also, she's, she's combining accents between... Like New York accents, uh, British accent, like almost like a, like a reggae act, like like a Jamaican accent, um, to the Swedish ethnicity, to like more American. It's weird. She's a chameleon. Um, I know her. My my wife was pointing out that her brother did a had a hit in the '90s, uh, Blue Eyed or Black Eyed, whatever his name is, Cherry. But um, I could get more into her after just listening to that record. The follow up actually was. Highly, more highly regarded, so, um, but Nana, Nana, I always called her Nina, but Nana Cherry, uh, with, um, Raw Like Sushi at number 18. Number 17, well, I've talked about this a couple years ago when I bought it, the Kevin Gilbert performed and produced album with Robert Ferris, No Two, self-titled, the only album they ever did, um, with Chris Kello, K-H-R-I-S, um, the hit, there's a couple hits on here. My heart is in the game. You can never go home and tour us. But yeah, Kevin plays on this. And of course, Robert Ferris's songwriting talents have, have gone over ad nauseum over the last, especially the thud stuff in the last couple years. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, a fun record. I don't, I'm not attached to it, but I like it. And I mean, I have my bias because of Kevin Gilbert, but I guess you could say I have a small bias because it's Robert Ferris too. Now, Robert Ferris has a solo album that some people got, and I was trying to see if I could get a copy. It's like nowhere to be found online, but the the family has it. Like his wife was sending it to some people a few years ago, but I don't know if I'll ever get to hear it. But anyway, I'd love to. But anyway, no, the No Two album, number eighteen, number seventeen rather. Not the last time we'll we'll be hearing from Kevin Gilbert, of course, on this list. Number sixteen, showing the wife's copy again, of course. Janet Jackson's follow-up to Control, not her debut album, of course, that was like, it's like her third album, but this is like her fourth album. In some ways, a bigger album even than Control, although it's pretty equal. I believe Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis worked with her again. Let's see if it tells. Co-producer Janet Jackson, Jelly Bean Johnson. Well, maybe not. Um, anyway, this has... A lot of hits, of course. The title track, um, my favorite Janet Jackson song, Ex Escapade, um, you know, uh, Miss You Much. Um, I, wrote the, I wrote it down, I'm just looking at it here. Um, what have you, I think this is the one that has What Have You Done For Me Lately. 
uh, Black Cat, which she's doing arguably some rock music with Black Cat. No, actually, what have you done for me lately? I think it was on Control, but Love Will Never Do with Do Without You, State of the World. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a good record. I mean, I my wife would be able to speak more to it, but um, given that it had a number of hits uh, and it's got my favorite Janet Jackson song. I had to put it in here somewhere. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I thought that she worked with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis again, but maybe not. Um, at least they're not listed on the back. I'm not going to mess around with her copy. She's got another copy, but, and I don't know why that the concept rhythm nation, 1814, there's probably something more behind, behind that about that. But, um, anyway, that's number Janet Jackson's rhythm nation, 1814, um, number 16, number 15, Voivod's Nothing Face. Well, I can say I'm still not a massive, or I haven't really been won over by Voivod that much. I will say I was listening to it the other day, and I've listened to it in the past. I, I like it. I like moments. The musicianship is very good. I know I, I can see why people like them, and I've got a couple of their records, and this was not the one that was produced by Terry Brown, but this also features the, the cover of Astronomy Domine by, by Pink Floyd. Um... But, um, I mean, the vocals are kind of just, and eh, almost, I feel like he's, it's like dork metal, really. The vocals sound, he's just kind of there. He's, it's not repulsive, because there are vocals that just kind of bore me and re repulse me. It's just sort of, I, I would think this music would work better for me with better vocals. But at the same time, again, the vocals don't bother me to the point where I'm just repulsed by their music in, in general. And I have to admit, the second half, I was kind of turning my head a little bit between inner combustion, pre-ignition, into my, into my hypercube especially, and sub-effect. I mean, the bass lines are pretty crazy. It's not really thrash metal in the sense, it doesn't sound like Metallica or um, Megadeth, really. It's really more like bass-driven groove metal. I mean, it's almost like if Pantera were doing prog in a way with kind of a mid-level vocal vocalist in some ways, but then there's also like a space element to it. I, I The band that I think they draw the most inspiration from, talk about prog, is not Pink Floyd necessarily, not Rush, even though they're from Canada. It's, it's definitely King Crimson. It's more or mechanical, sort of dissonant at points. Um, almost, I, remind, I was reminded a little bit of Time of Orchids actually in some ways, but anyway. Nothing Face from uh, Voivod. Uh, some people consider their favorite. Some people only like that one record, but um, at number four, 15. So number 14, another sort of um, cult band album. But I have to admit, I have a little more appreciation, not dramatically, but a little more appreciation for it. And that's Watchtower's Control and Resistance. Um, yeah, it's it's one it one ups the debut album from Watchtower. Cause I, I talked about that in the, was it the 85 video? 84, 85, I don't remember what year that was. Um, and they changed singers. Jason McMaster was the first singer, I believe, on on the first record. Um, is that album? That album is not even on here. It's not on Spotify. But anyway, um, there's some crazy stuff. It's it's almost like Spiral Architect and Cynic must have been taking some clues from this band because the musicianship and the bass play are similar to the first record, but the production's better. The bass playing is absolutely nuts. This is some of the most technical bass playing ever recorded. I mean, they would have, give Meshuga a run for their money. You know, I mean, Jocko Pistorius would have a good time trying to play some of the stuff. Um, the Fall of Reason is just an absolute tour de force. And, you know, the vocals are cheesy. And I remember when I listened to this many years ago, I thought this is like hair metal, but doing, like, technical hair metal. I'm not as bugged by it. I kind of kind of come to grips with i don't mind very cheesy high-pitched vocals sometimes if the music is so good and again well sometimes vocals ruin music for me i'll admit but in this case it doesn't really ruin it i mean it's sort of there i don't think i'd ever become obsessed with it and it's, it's it's admittedly a mood it's i don't listen to tactical music you know i want to listen to like spawn of possession or something like that i also could consider listening to watchtower and i mean they they're taking what fate's warning did and they one-upped it i mean this is Blotted science, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy, and it's, the production, again, I can't stress how, how it sounds better than the last record, the, the debut album, because the production's better. So, um, anyway, I know it has Ra, um, Bob, or Rob, Ron Jarzombeck, the guitarist. That, I think he was in the first one anyway, but Control and Resistance from Watchtower, number 14. Number 13, Lenny Kravitz's debut album, Let Love Rule. 
And there's a lot of good tracks on here. I've always known it for the title track and Mr. Cab Driver. There's some Effenheimers in that. Um, kind of reminds me of Day Tripper. Um, but there's some really cool sax on that track and some other, many tracks on there. Does anybody out there, out there, even care, has some really nice cello. Some of it is muffled, though. It's weird how the productions of a product, of the maybe the production or the budget that he had, even though I don't think he was, like, the most struggling musician considering he he did have family that were successful in, in Hollywood but um it's muffled funk but it works um the biggest highlight though is the, the second to last track I believe it is Empty Hands that is proc <laughs> the cello and violin arrangement is awesome so um yeah Lenny Kravitz is let love rule I mean he does some screaming when I first got into King's X the immediate impression I always thought of was Lenny Kravitz but I was thinking of uh, are you gonna go my way and you know that's the Lenny Kravitz I know better uh, but the screaming he does, I can sort of understand, although King's X predates him, you know, by a fair amount, but, um, anyway. Let Love Rule from Lenny Kravitz, number 13. Number 12, Queen's the Miracle. I talked about that in the anniversary, um, ep uh, video a couple of days ago. Um, it's got Why well, I Want It All, but that's, that's a hit. It's got more than just the chorus, um, Breakthrough, the title track, Scandal, the over and over reminds me of the band Royal Hunt. I don't know, Royal Hunt were probably big Queen fans. Um, My Baby Does Me sounds like an adult contemporary song, but uh, Was It All Worth It? Love the or orchest orchestrated part on that. It's a pretty good record. It's not really thought of and talked about that much, only that I want it all, really. I think it's better than um, uh, Kind of Magic, actually, which given the fact I have Kind of Magic on vinyl, I should pick this up at some point. How it compares to Innuendo? I don't know. i got to listen to Innuendo again. I have it on vinyl. I've listened to it many years ago. So we'll see when I do the uh, whatever that was, 91 list. So, and you could tell it was like, you know, Freddie was trying to do as many songs. You know, he was dealing with the complications of HIV at that point, even though he, no one knew about it. Anyway, that was in 89, of course. So, uh, number 11, Sabotage's Gutter Ballet. I didn't write any notes down. I like this album. I don't like as much as um, I don't like it as much as uh, Hollow the Mountain King. I had it on cassette tape. I think I still do in a box. I couldn't find it on my cassettes. But um, the title track is my favorite, and that's the most progressive on it. Um, I thought they used some flute on this album, but I guess they didn't. But I was kind of fa feeling like I was enjoying like pretty much the the second half of it, especially. Starting from Silk and Steel, or actually from when, when, when the Crowds Are Gone, all the way to Summer's Rain. I mean, every track has that classic Sabotage sound, the really punchy riffs, the dynamics, kind of epic, or orchestrated classical nature, classical music influence, even though they weren't working with um, Paul O'Neill at this point still. Um, John Oliva, of course, still kind of has that raspy voice at points. But I, it's grown on me. It's originally, when I got into Sabotage, I liked Zach Stevens. I couldn't get into his voice. I like it. I don't like it as much as Stevens still. But, um, yeah, it's... it's. I mean, it, it has influences from New Wave of British Heavy Metal, of course. Um, it's progressive in a lot of ways. It's a little bit of, like, power metal, but it doesn't emphasize speed as much. I don't know if they were listening to, like, Halloween or Scorpions at that point. But, um, but yeah, Sabotage is gutter ballet. Not quite as good, but a good follow-up to Hollow Mountain King. And so, of course, they had... The record after it was another concept album. We're still in the Chris Oliva, you know, he's still with the band at that point, of course. But um, so that's number eleven. So now we're in the top ten. XTC, which I've considered this my favorite XTC album for a number of years. Although eh, now revisiting it again, I kind of think maybe Skylarking is slightly better. But number ten, Oranges and Lemons. The two biggest tracks on here. Well, my favorite song still by them is King for a Day. Um, but the Mayor of Simpleton is, is really good. But then the Garden of Earthly Delights is is a is another favorite. There's I mean it's quirky. It's it's XTC. I think it's refined. I think the element of doing you know Skylarking it took off a, a little bit of the quirk out of them. But it was still I mean Oranges and Lemons sounds like a pop like a very sugary power pop title. Um, and the production just is better. I mean you compare this to the early XTC, the production sounds a lot better. But um, you know, I mean, I like Merely a Man has some really great moments. Um, I don't know if I wrote anything. I think I did. It's like looking for my... Yeah. Uh, Scarecrow People is another one. There's a twangy element. One of the Millions. Um, 
yeah, there's a trumpet part in Mule Man that ha has like is very Beatles like. So um, across the Antibes also, so there's a lot of trumpet, on, and then there's like the song um, "Hold Me, Daddy." Was it no? Was it, across the Antibes, yeah, the, across the Antibes has like a Talking Heads element, um, uh, and then "Hold Me, Daddy" has this fun danceable rhythm towards the end. So yeah, I you know it's not as memorable as I would even say um, Skylarking is, but on the strength of those those two or three tracks at the beginning alone, it has to go pretty high this year. So, number 10, um, Oranges and Lemons from XTC. Number 9, all right, so we see a live album. Um, the first, I think this is the first or second Rush release I ever got. A show of Hands, which was from the sort of mid to late 80s, of course, period. Um, a lot of songs from Grace Under Pressure and um, Grace Under Pressure, uh, Power Windows, and hold your fire, of course. Um, I have a lot of, because it was one of the first Rush things I got, I have a lot of sentimental value. I've always loved the version of um, uh, Time, or not Time Stand Still on here, um, Subdivisions. I also like the fact that this is separated between different parts of the world. There's three songs from the UK, three songs from, one song from Louisiana, two songs from, one song from Arizona, one from California, and San Diego. Yeah, I mean, each side has like a variety of different shows, so it makes it kind of interesting you get the different parts of the tour over like a year, year and a half, two years, but I mean, you know, is it, is it not a class, is classic of a live album compared to Exit Age Laugh or even All the World's a Stage? I guess not, but I, I have a soft spot for this, be, again, for, for sentimental reasons. Um, you know, it has Manhattan, Manhattan Project, Just an Early Warning, uh, the Rhythm Method, the Neil Peart solo, you know, fronted piece, um, uh, Force 10, Time Stand Still. You know, I mean, I guess most people on the, from a set list standpoint don't prefer this as much, but I'm I'm an 80s Rush lover also, so it, I, it, I really got get a lot of, though there's songs from the 80s that weren't on here um, that, that I would love, that they did live at points, but, um, so number nine. Number eight, all right, so here's my cassette tape. I don't have this on CD or vinyl. Someday I would like to get it. Seeds of Love from Tears for Fears. Um... It's always been sort of the record that a lot of people think I would like more. People talk about, like, from a prog standpoint, Tears for Fears doing their proggiest. And I've always kind of liked it. I mean, Sowing in the Seeds of Love is a single that everyone knows, even though it's basically kind of riffing off of I Am the Walrus. It's a magnificently sort of produced track, though. Um, but, I mean, Woman in Chains, you know, the first track, and then Bad Man's song, which is like eight minutes... There's like a big like ethnic or world music element and a big jazz element, but I I listened to this again the other day and I think it clicked with me a little more than it has in the past. I don't know if I'm willing to say I like it better than especially Song for the Big Chair, but it's pretty close. I mean, I would bump it maybe up to four stars. I mean, there's some wonderful performance, although it's mostly driven by Roland. Kurt Smith seems to be not he didn't do a lot of the songwriting. You can kind of understand why they were drifting away at this point, but um. It's a super creative, like, almost cinematic, kind of, you know, cere cerebral, almost, like, surreal, kind of, the, it's a soundtrack-like element to this album that kind of begs me to, like, give it more time and even appreciate it more than I do, and I, why I probably want to, want to get it on vinyl, but, um, um, yeah, as it is, I've, I've always thought it was good, but, I mean, I always, I know they put out that version with the um, bonus tracks and the, the Blu-ray and all that stuff, and be like, are you going to buy that, aren't you? I'm like... No, I don't know why. I don't even have it on vinyl. But I probably should have brought it, and I could maybe still get it. I don't know. So, Seeds of Love from Tears for Fears, um, which I think Tears Rolled Down was one of the bonus tracks, and I have a compilation which included that. Well, that was one of, the, one of the CDs I got from BMG back in, like, 92, 93. I still have. And that's number eight. Number seven. So, this is kind of hard to believe it's this low, but this is a great year. That's partly to do with it. Seasons End from Marillion, the first record with Steve Hogarth. An album I do love, I mean, but I've always felt like I would want to love this more. There were other records with Hogarth I grew to love more. But it does have Berlin, which is a uh, top ten Marillion track for me, and I always loved it. I always loved Easter, even though I've heard it so many times. It's a, a live staple. Uh, it's just an earworm, and it's just wonderful. Um, I, King of Sunset Town... I, I like I like the intro that this the synth pad I talked about you know Kevin Gilbert using like a patch like that on um, what is it uh, till I get her back but um, 
the title track is the other real signature track. I mean, it's dreamy and very kind of atmospheric and season-like, like snow. You think of snow in the winter when you... It's, it's sad. It's very melancholy. I, that's a super melancholy, one of their most melancholy songs. I like The Uninvited Guest. The, the video is interesting. Holloway Girl is okay. Hooks in You, I can take or leave. I mean, it's fine. It's not the worst song they ever did, but it's not a song I, I claim. A lot of people love that song. It's a little more energetic and, you know, riffy. Uh, and then The Space. The Space is pretty epic, although I think I wanted to like The Space more than I did. I mean, again, I'm a super long lifer fanboy of Marillion, so I'm going to naturally be objective and somewhat critical about a record from them that a lot of people love. Um, and a lot of these songs, of course, were written when Fish was still in the band. They just changed the, some of the lyrics. But, um, yeah, I mean, Season's End's always been a record I, I've enjoyed, appreciated. But it's never been, like, the top three record from Marillion for me. But that's kind of why it en one reason why it ended up only at number seven. Um, mostly more to do with the fact that the top ten is just really good. So number six, let me go say, this is sacrilege, have having Marillion below this. We have Dream Theater's debut album, when Dream Day Unite. I've talked a lot about this, but I like every track on here. Status Seekers, pop song, it's, should have been on the radio, it's great. You know, R.I.P. Charlie Dominici, um, but he sounds great on this. A Fortune and Lies, The Killing Hand is probably my favorite track on here. I love the lyrics from a lot of these songs that Kevin Moore wrote, like um, Only a Matter of Time and Afterlife. And like songs like Light Fusing Getaway and The Ones Who Helped to Set the Sun were songs I didn't initially get as into, but have been growers and like they're better, they're great deep tracks. I, I just, you know, this record, the Dream Theater fan base, a lot of them, unless they're an old school fan, don't care for it. The newer Dream Theater fans of the last 15, 20 years think this is one of their worst records. I, don't, I mean, the production is what it is. I think the songwriting is still really good. I love the, the sort of lead bass lines from John Mayung. Um, even though it's not as heavy, and you know, if it was produced now, to hear it with Labrie now would be interesting, I guess. They, of course, did the live version, but... I've always had a soft spot for this record, and when I first got into Dream Theater, at one point it was my favorite of their th the three records I knew. I actually was liking it a little more than Image, because it Image is word because it largely because it sounded so much like Rush and Charlie Dominici sounded a lot like Geddy Lee, and I was coming from Rush fanboy headspace. So, number six, Dream Theater's When Dream and Day Unite. <sighs> Not number five, Faith No More is the real thing. Like. Um, like Steve Hogarth with Marillion, of course, and uh, Charlie Dom Dominici from Dr with Dream Theater, in a way. This is the first album with Mike Patton, and I'm a, I'm a huge Mike Patton. This is I think I find I like the records that came after it, but I actually find this to be the the best record they did. And everyone knows Epic, of course. I think it holds up, even though it's been played to death. It's it's got that riff and you know the, the characterized vocals, the the rapping, you know, the the froggy, you know. But I I don't mind it, but. Songs like From Out of Nowhere, Falling to Pieces, and the title track the, the, for the, to the real thing make this record. I mean, every record, uh, every track rather on here, Zombie Eaters. Um, I love the use of keyboards on here. They, they use keyboards and piano really well. Um, you know, this album, I think, and even though, again, it's more poppy, kind of just works track to track, and I think it was a big influence on prog metal and even like mo Patton's vocal style, the range, the screaming, the, the characterized vocals. Um, he did had an influence on stuff like just death metal and progressive death metal. So um, it's experimental metal, really. That's what it is. Even though it's funk metal, you know, it, all the styles work and the songwriting works. Um, Surprise, you're dead. That that song sounds like it should have been in Bill and Ted's, one of the Bill and Ted's movies, like the second one, but actually this was before that. I don't think that was used in it. I mean, but, of course, this was written before that movie, if it was. I know they were on the Bogus Journey soundtrack, but, um, yeah, I Underwater Love, the, mor the Morning After is just is fantastic. This record, that's why it's this high, because, you know, I just appreciate it from a songwriting and melodic standpoint, the use, you know, the different experiments they did, and just to hear Patton kind of, you know, Chuck Mosley was a good singer, but Patton one-upped him. And, again, I... Um, he came from Mr. Bungle. I don't know if Mr. Bungle's first album had come out, if they actually had released anything at that point, but it was kind of weird that, you know, I've never been that into Mr. Bungle, but a little bit. A few songs like California, off of California, like Retro Vertigo, but um, Faith No More and um, The Real Thing's always been a record I've just appreciated over the years in life. So that's number five. Um, number four, of course, one of my favorites. You've got pretty much all favorites coming up. Fate's Warnings, Perfect Symmetry. I've talked about this album a lot, but it features Nothing Left to Stay. That's the the best song on it. Uh, Through Different Eyes is another one that I've always appreciated. Um, 
It fades hands. It includes, includes the services of um, Kevin Moore, I believe, of Dream Theater, who hadn't released... I don't know if this came out before with Dream of Day Unite, so he hadn't even released anything uh, as a musician. But um, Chasing Time is Dreamy. I love the violin arrangement. I know that Jim was influenced by Kansas on that song, especially he's a big Kansas fan. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I could... <laughs> Just want to, you know, as a, as a static axe, world apart, part of the machine I've always liked. Um, I mean, and you know, is it, I ra in my rankings, it was in the middle. I'm a, I'm a huge, um, I'll give this person's name away. Just, a, I'm just a super Fates Warning fan, super fan or whatever, so it's going to go pretty high. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a, like a mechanical, almost, you would call it like dark or dissonant record at points. It's prog metal and they were, you know, wasn't, raves kind of, you know, this was produced by Terry Brown, I believe. Well, Parallels was, I know. I don't remember if this one, but Ray Ray Alder's vocals on this album, the second album with Ray Alder, were a little more, you know, scaled down. He did some of the false sales, but he didn't, you know, stretch out his voice as much, which for better or for worse. Um, I mean, nothing left to say he does to an extent, but um, anyway, uh, <laughs> perfect symmetry. You know, the first album with Mark Zonder on drums. A super favorite, super influential album in the, the world of progressive metal and drumming. Um, number four. Number three. Number three, if I'm doing this right. Yep. Rush's Presto. The last classic great re re album that Rush made to me. Um, has several songs I love. The Past is sort of a, you know, a song about a guy who's going to commit suicide or anything like that. It's always touched me, uh, moved me in some ways. I always think about that song. It's... Um, one that I've, I've definitely broken into tears, but um, songs like um, Red Tide. Red Tide re quotes uh, Shakespeare and like that, but the climax and the dynamics in Red Tide are just great. But Chain Lightning, Cho Don't Tell about a, you know, a trial. <laughs> you know? Um, the title track. There's not really any songs I don't like. Uh, available Light People uh, as a fan favorite. Um you know, uh, Hand Over Fist, the bridge in that is wonderful. The rest of it's okay. It's about that game with, you know, rock, paper, scissors and stuff like that. But I don't know why. I mean, people think the production's thin and, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's still using the keyboards and there's not enough guitar and not enough punch. I don't know. Show Don't Tell is a pretty riffy song itself, but I don't have a problem with it. I think it's slightly different than some of the other 80s Rush albums because it's not as synth and more piano driven at points, but... I, the, just the vocal melodies, some of the the songwriting the, itself, just itself, just is what really works for me. I, I mean, I know the band themselves were not a, not like obsessed with this record, and even on the tour, they didn't even do a lot of the songs I love. They did War War Paint, War Paint. I know they did do, and they they brought that bad. Scars, the bass line's great. I've always loved this record. I mean, I've loved it more and more after I got into them. But for thirty years, this has always been a record I've always enjoyed more and more and from the 80s push comes to shove i would put this probably ahead of a few of the other 80s albums which again sounds weird and rush's level of consistency leads up to presto i go i contend from fly by night or at least from caress of steel all the way up to presto there's not a record that's it's almost all flawless records so um so number two we have the second album which came out april 1st I believe 1989, I didn't even, like, note that, actually, on the anniversary. I don't know if I did that. Giraffe's second album, The View From Here. I mean, learning more about how this record was made is kind of slightly tainted, but it's Kevin Gilbert, and it's him doing prog, and he's upping his game in a lot of ways in terms of production and songwriting, and they did the suite, even though he says it was kind of ripped off from close to the edge, that home and progress uh, suite uh, at the beginning. But um, Air Dance is the other, like, just, unbelievable prog song although I, I think of genesis's um ripples a little bit and undertow when i hear that song sometimes but i love the uh the piano rhythm with da -da 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 -da. really fast i don't know if it's like in seven um but this also has uh the way back home the first version of way back home which later was put on shaming it through all fall down from here to there also the first version of from here to there. so a lot of songs that were re-recorded but i think they still work really well this is with the giraffe guys um, holding out with both hands is a ballad. Uh, waiting for the rain, very energetic. I will survive. You know, um, I don't know. It's so close between those two records. You know, the the creative element of the concept I think is better on Power of Suggestion, and they use like samples and stuff. But actually, I just I feel like there was a slight improvement 
that I prefer on this record. I mean, it's like they were doing more prog, really, in a way. And when Kevin does prog, I love it. When other people do prog, not necessarily always. But anyway, yeah, Giraffe is a view from here. Number two. And number one, the sophomore album from one of my favorite bands, of course, King's X's Gretchen Goes Nebraska, their, their concept album. Of course, the first track references the, the previous record's title, which is the Lewis Carroll, whatever novel, Out of the Silent Planet. And actually, if I'm choosing one King's X song, I might do a King's X song ranking someday. I need to do that at some point. Push Come to Shove, that still might be my favorite King's X song. I love the, harm, the vocal harmonies and the kind of groove and the, the energy and the build on that. But, I mean, this is a concept album. They talk about the Wizard of Oz. There's a story in it about the girl Gretchen goes to Nebraska. She's lost, you know, and she meets, you know, this woman and everything like that. But... Um, Over My Head was a banger. The energy's off the charts on that. Um, maybe their most well-known song, at least among the fan base. Um, Summerland, most recommendable song. Summerland, great, great riff. Kind of ironic, but um, lyrically. Um, Pleiades, that, that's another one. Of, but, you know, everybody knows a little bit of something. The difference, I'll never be the same. The groove is great on that. Um, Fall On Me is in your face. Um, Mission, it just... I like that better than Rush's mission, actually. It, it, they, it's kind of less is more. It's, it, the concept, even though it's not overtly conceptual, like it doesn't get cheesy, kind of makes this more interesting. It's more of a journey record. Um, I mean, it has a few of these, three or four of these songs that were kind of fan favorites that they play live. I've always condemned I always wanted to see them play the whole thing live. They may have done it. I can't remember. I should know this. The King's X trivia, but um, they, like released it as a live record, but... Yeah, Gretchen Goes Nebraska, you know, a cheesy title. I know it got made fun of, but ultimately it's held up and it's become a fan favorite in some ways the most influential record. Actually, pro it probably is. There's some other records that are pretty influential, but Push Cup of Stuff, people think, oh, Gretchen Goes Nebraska, at least among musicians especially. So I love Gretchen Goes Nebraska. And, you know, again, I Wizard of Oz, the Wizard of Oz influence kind of put this over the top because I love the Wizard of Oz, of course, so. So that's it for my 1989 list. Hopefully you get on to 1990, maybe 91 next week. What are your favorite albums from 1989? What did I miss? Of course, this is a rough draft, so someday and then down the road in the future, I'll hopefully be able to kind of go over this again and add some stuff and change some things around. But thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.